This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Gods of Mars Written by Edgar Rice Burroughs And read by J. D. Weber On the south shores of Lake Superior Forward Twelve years had passed since I had laid the body of my great-uncle, Captain John Carter of Virginia, away from the sight of men in that strange mausoleum in the old cemetery at Richmond. Often I had pondered on the odd instructions he had left me, governing the construction of his mighty tomb, and especially those parts which directed that he be laid in an open casket, and the ponderous mechanism which controlled the bolts of the vault's huge door be accessible only from the inside. Twelve years has passed since I read the remarkable manuscript of this remarkable man, this man who remembered no childhood, and who could not even offer a vague guess as to his age, who was always young, and yet who had dandled my grandfather's great-grandfather upon his knee, this man who had spent ten years upon the planet Mars, who had fought for the green men of Barsoom, and fought against them, who had fought for and against the red men, and who had won the ever-beautiful Dejah Thoris, princess of Helium, for his wife, and for nearly ten years had been a prince of the house of Tardos Mors, Jeddak of Helium. Twelve years had passed since his body had been found upon the bluff, before his cottage overlooking the Hudson, and oftentimes during these long years I had wondered if John Carter were really dead or if he again roamed the dead sea-bottoms of that dying planet, if he had returned to Barsoom to find that he had opened the frowning portals of the mighty atmosphere plant in time to save the countless millions who were dying of asphyxiation on that far-gone day that had seen him hurled ruthlessly through the forty-eight million miles of space back to earth once more. I had wondered if he had found his black-haired princess, and the slender son he had dreamed was with her in the royal gardens of Tardos Mors, awaiting his return. Or had he found that he had been too late, and thus gone back to a living death upon a dead world? Or was he really dead, after all, never to return either to his mother Earth or his beloved Mars? Thus I was lost in a useless speculation one sultry August evening when old Ben, my body servant, handed me a telegram. Tearing it open, I read, Meet me tomorrow, Hotel Riley, Richmond, John Carter. Early the next morning I took the first train for Richmond, and within two hours was being ushered into the room occupied by John Carter. As I entered, he rose to greet me his old-time cordial smile of welcome lightening his handsome face. Apparently he had not aged a minute, but was still the straight, clean-limbed fighting man of thirty. His keen gray eyes were undimmed, and the only lines upon his face were the lines of an iron character and determination that always had been there since first I remembered him, nearly thirty-five years before. "'Well, nephew,' he greeted me, "'do you feel as though you were seeing a ghost?' or suffering from the effects of too many of your Uncle Ben juleps. Juleps, I reckon, I replied, for I certainly feel mighty good, but maybe it's just the sight of you again that affects me. You have been back to Mars? Tell me. And Dejah Thoris? You found her well and awaiting you? Yes, I have been to Barsoom again, and, but it's a long story, too long to tell in the limited time I have before I must return. I have learned the secret, nephew, and I may traverse the trackless void at my will, coming and going between the countless planets as I list. But my heart is always in Barsoom, and while it is there in the keeping of my Martian princess, I doubt that I shall ever again leave the dying world that is my life. I have come now because my affection for you prompted me to see you once more before you pass over forever into that other life that I shall never know and which, though I have died thrice, and shall die again tonight, as you know death, I am as unable to fathom as you are. Even the wise and mysterious therns of Barsoom, that ancient cult which for countless ages has been credited with holding the secret of life and death in their impregnable fastness upon the hither slopes of the mountains of Oz, are as, in, as ignorant as we are. I have proved it, though I near lost my life in the doing of it, but you shall read it all in the notes I have been making during the last three months that I have been back upon earth. He patted a swelling portfolio that lay on the table at his elbow. 
I know that you are interested and that you believe, and I know that the world, too, is interested, though they will not believe for many years, yes, for many ages, since they cannot understand. Earthmen have not yet progressed to a point where they can comprehend the things that I have written in those notes. Give them what you wish of it, what you think will not harm them, but do not feel aggrieved that they laugh at you. That night I walked down to the cemetery with him. At the door of his vault he turned and pressed my hand. Goodbye, nephew, he said. I may never see you again, for I doubt that I can ever bring myself to leave my wife and boy while they live, and the span of life upon Barsoom is often more than a thousand years. He entered the vault, the great door swung slowly to, the ponderous bolts grated into place, the lock clicked. I have never seen Captain John Carter of Virginia since. But here is the story of his return to Mars on that other occasion, as I have gleaned it from that great mass of notes which he left for me upon the table of his room in the hotel at Richmond. There is much which I have left out, much which I have not dared to tell, but you will find the story of his second search for Dejah Thoris, Princess of Helium, even more remarkable than was his first manuscript, which I gave to an unbelieving world a short time since, and through which we followed the fighting Virginian across Dead Sea bottoms under the moons of Mars. Edgar Rice Burroughs Chapter 1 The Planet Men As I stood upon the bluff before my cottage on that clear cold night in the early part of March, 1886, the noble Hudson flowing like the gray and silent spectacle of dead river below me. I felt again the strange, compelling influence of the mighty god of war, my beloved Mars, which for ten long and lonesome years I have implored with outstretched arms to carry me back to my lost love. Not since that other March night in 1866, when I had stood without that Arizona cave in which my still, lifeless body lay wrapped in the similitude of earthly death, had I felt the irresistible attraction of the god of my profession. With arms outstretched toward the red eye of the great star, I stood praying for return of that strange power which twice had drawn me through the immensity of space, praying as I had prayed on a thousand nights before during the long ten years that I had waited in hope. Suddenly a qualm of nausea swept over me. My senses swam. My knees gave beneath me, and I pitched headlong to the ground upon the very verge of the dizzy bluff. Instantly my brain cleared, and there swept back across the threshold of my memory the vivid picture of the horrors of that ghostly Arizona cave. Again, as on that far-gone night, my muscles refused to respond to my will, and again, as though even here upon the banks of the placid Hudson, I could hear the awful moans and rustling of the fearsome thing which had lurked and threatened me from the dark recesses of the cave. I made the same mighty and superhuman effort to break the bonds of the strange anesthesia which held me, and again came the sharp click as of the sudden parting of a taut wire, and I stood naked and free beside the staring, lifeless thing that had so recently pulsed with the warm, red lifeblood of John Carter. With scarcely a parting glance I turned my eyes again toward Mars, lifted my hands toward this lured rays, and waited. Nor did I have long to wait, for scarce had I turned air I shot with the rapidity of thought into the awful void before me. There was the same instant of unthinkable cold and utter darkness that I experienced twenty years before, and then I opened my eyes in another world, beneath the burning rays of a hot sun, which beat through a tiny opening in the dome of a mighty forest in which I lay. The scene that met my eyes was so unmartian that my heart sprang to my throat as the sudden fear swept through me that I had been aimlessly tossed upon some strange planet by a cruel fate. Why not? What guide had I through the trackless wastes of interplanetary space? What assurance that I might not as well be hurtled to some far distant star of another solar system as to Mars? I lay upon a close-cropped swad of red, grass-like vegetation, and about me stretched a grove of strange and beautiful trees, covered with huge and gorgeous blossoms, and filled with brilliant, voiceless birds. I call them birds since they were winged, but mortal eye ne'er rested on such odd, unearthly shapes. 
The vegetation was similar to that which covers the lawns of the red Martians of the great waterways, but the trees and birds were unlike anything that I had ever seen upon Mars, and then through the further trees I could see that most unmartian of all sights, an open sea, its blue water shimmering beneath the brazen sun. As I rose to investigate further, I experienced the same ridiculous catastrophe that had met my first attempt to walk under Martian conditions. The lesser attraction of this smaller planet and the reduced air pressure of its greatly rarefied atmosphere afforded so little resistance to my earthly muscles that the ordinary exertion of the mere act of rising sent me several feet into the air and precipitated me upon my face in the soft and brilliant grass of this strange world. This experience, however, gave me some slightly increased assurance that, after all, I might indeed be in some, to me, unknown corner of Mars, and this was very possible, since during my ten years' residence upon the planet I had explored but a comparatively tiny area of its vast expanse. I rose again, laughing at my forgetfulness, and soon had mastered once more the art of attuning my earthly sinews to these changed conditions. As I walked slowly down the imperceptible slope toward the sea, I could not help but note the park-like appearance of the swarded trees. The grass was as close-cropped and carpet-like as some old English lawn, and the trees themselves showed evidence of careful pruning to a uniform height of about fifteen feet from the ground, so that as one turned his glance in any direction the forest had the appearance at a little distance of a vast, high-sealed chamber. All these evidence of careful and systematic cultivation convinced me that I had been fortunate enough to make my entry into Mars on this second occasion through the domain of a civilized people, and that when I should find them I would be accorded the courtesy and protection that my rank as a prince of the house of Tordos Mors entitled me to. The trees of the forest attracted my deep admiration as I proceeded toward the sea. Their great stems, some of them fully a hundred feet in diameter, attested to their prodigious height, which I could only guess at, since at no point could I penetrate their dense foliage above me to more than sixty or eighty feet. As far aloft as I could see, the stems and branches and twigs were as smooth and as highly polished as the newest of American-made pianos. The wood of some of the trees was as black as ebony, while their nearest neighbors might perhaps gleam in the subdued light of the forest as clear and white as the finest china, or again they were a source scarlet, yellow, or deepest purple. And in the same way was the foliage as gay and variegated as the stems, while the blooms that clustered thick upon them may not be described in any earthly tongue, and indeed might challenge the language of the gods. As I neared the confines of the forest I beheld before me, and between the grove and the open sea, a broad expanse of meadowland, and as I was about to emerge from the shadows of the trees a sight met my eyes that banished all romantic and poetic reflection upon the beauties of the strange landscape. To my left the sea extended as far as the eye could reach, before me only a vague dim line indicated its further shore while at my right a mighty river, broad and placid and majestic, flowed between scarlet banks to empty into the quiet sea before me. At a little distance up the river rose mighty perpendicular bluffs, from the very base of which the river seemed to rise. But it was not these inspiring and magnificent evidence of nature's grandeur that took my immediate attention from the beauties of the forest. It was the sight of a score of figures moving slowly about the meadow near the bank of the mighty river. Odd, grotesque shapes they were, unlike anything that I had ever seen upon Mars, and yet, at a distance, most manlike in appearance. The large specimens seemed to be about ten or fifteen feet in height when they stood erect, and to be proportioned as to torso and lower extremities precisely as is earthly man. Their arms, however, were very short, and from where I stood seemed as though fashioned much after the manner of an elephant's trunk, in that they moved in sinuous and snake-like undulation, as though entirely without bony structure, or if there were bones it seemed that they must be vertebral in nature. 
As I watched them from behind the stem of a huge tree, one of the creatures moved slowly in my direction, engaged in the occupation that seemed to be the principal business of each of them, and which consisted in running their oddly shaped hands over the surface of the sword, for what purpose I could not determine. As he approached quite close to me, I obtained an excellent view of him, and though I was later to become better acquainted with his kind, I may say that single cursory examination of this awful travesty on nature would have proved quite sufficient to my desires had I been a free agent. The fastest flyer of the Helamic navy could not quickly enough have carried me far from this hideous creature. Its hairless body was a strange and ghoulish blue, except for a broad band of white which encircled its protruding single eye, and an eye that was all dead white, pupil, iris, and ball. Its nose was a ragged, inflamed, circular hole in the center of its blank face, a hole that resembled more closely nothing that I could think of other than a fresh bullet wound which has not yet commenced to bleed. Below this repulsive orifice the face was quite blank to the chin, for the thing had no mouth that I could discover. The head, with the exception of the face, was covered by a tangled mass of jet black hair some eight or ten inches in length. Each hair was about the bigness of a large angleworm, and as the thing moved the muscles of its scalp, its awful head covering seemed to writhe and wiggle and crawl about the fearsome face as though indeed each separate hair was endowed with independent life. The body and the legs were as symmetrically human as nature could have fashioned them, and the feet, too, were human in shape, but of monstrous proportions. From heel to toe they were fully three feet long, and very flat, and very broad. As it came quite close to me, I discovered that its strange movements running its odd hands over the surface of the turf were the result of its peculiar method of feeding, which consists in cropping off the tender vegetation with its razor-like talons and sucking it up from its two mouths, which lie one in the palm of each hand through its arm-like throats. In addition to the features which I had already described, the beast was equipped with a massive tail about six feet in length, quite round where it joined the body, but tapered in, tapering to a flat, thin blade toward the end, which trailed at right angles to the ground. By far the most remarkable feature of this most remarkable creature, however, were the two tiny replicas of it, each about six inches in length, which dangled one on either side from its armpits. They were suspended by a small stem which seemed to grow from the exact tops of their heads to where it connected them with the body of the adult. Whether they were the young or merely portions of a composite creature, I did not know. As I had been scrutinizing this weird monstrosity, the balance of the herd had fed quite close to me, and I now saw that while many had the smaller specimens dangling from them, not all were thus equipped, and I further noted that the little ones varied in size from what appeared to be but tiny unopened buds an inch in diameter through various stages of development to the full-fledged and perfectly formed creature of ten to twelve inches in length. Feeding with the herd were many of the little fellows not much larger than those which remained attached to their parents, and from the young of that size the herd graded up to the immense adults. Fearsome looking as they were, I did not know whether to fear them or not, for they did not seem to be particularly well equipped for fighting, and I was on the point of stepping from my hiding place and revealing myself to them to note the effect upon them of the sight of a man when my rash resolve was, fortunately for me, nipped in the bud by a strange, shrieking wail, which seemed to come from the direction of the bluffs at my right. Naked and unarmed as I was, my end would have been both speedily and horrible at the hands of these cruel creatures had I had time to put my resolve into execution. But at the moment of the shriek, each member of the herd turned in the direction from which the sound seemed to come and at the same instant every particular snake-like hair upon their heads rose stiffly perpendicular, as if it each had been a sentient organism looking or listening for the source or meaning of the wail. And indeed the latter proved to be the truth, 
for this strange growth upon the craniums of the plant men of Barsoom represents the thousand ears of these hideous creatures, the last remnant of the strange race which sprang from the original tree of life. Instantly every eye turned toward one member of the herd, a large fellow who evidently was the leader. A strange purring sound issued from the mouth in the palm of one of his hands, and at the same time he started rapidly toward the bluff, followed by the entire herd. Their speed and method of locomotion were both remarkable, springing as they did in great leaps of twenty or thirty feet, much after the manner of a kangaroo. They were rapidly disappearing when it occurred to me to follow them, and so, hurling caution to the winds, I sprang across the meadow in their wake with leaps and bounds even more prodigious than their own, for the muscles of an athletic earthman produced remarkable results when pitted against the lesser gravity and air pressure of Mars. Their way led directly towards the apparent source of the river at the base of the cliffs, and as I neared this point I found the meadow dotted with huge boulders that the ravages of time had evidently dislodged from the towering crags above. For this reason I came quite close to the cause of the disturbance before the scene broke upon my horrified gaze. As I topped a great boulder I saw the herd of plant men surrounding a little group of perhaps five or six green men and women of Barsoom. That I was indeed upon Mars I now had no doubt, for here were members of the wild hordes that people the dead sea bottoms and deserted cities of that dying planet. Here were the great males towering in all their majesty of their imposing height. Here were the gleaming white tusks protruding from their massive lower jaws to a point near the center of their foreheads, the laterally placed protruding eyes with which they could look forward or backward or to either side without turning their heads. Here the strange antenna-like ears rising from the tops of their foreheads and the additional pair of arms extending from midway between the so shoulders and the hips. Even without the glossy green hide and the metal ornaments which denoted the tribes to which they belonged, I would have known them on the instant for what they were. For where else in all the universe is their like duplicated? There were two men and four females in the party, and their ornaments denoted them as members of different hordes, a fact which tended to puzzle me infinitely, since the various hordes of green men of Barsoom are eternally at deadly war with one another, and never except on that single historic instant when the great Tars Tarkas of Thark gathered a hundred and fifty thousand green warriors from several hordes to march upon the doomed city of Zodanga to rescue Dejah Thoris, princess of Helium, from the clutches of Than Kors. Had I seen great green Martians of different hordes associated in other than mortal combat, but now they stood back to back, facing in wide-eyed amazement the very evidently hostile demonstrations of a common enemy. Both men and women were armed with long swords and daggers, but no firearms were in evidence, else it had been short shrift for the gruesome plant men of Barsoom. Presently the leader of the plant men charged the little party, and his method of attack was as remarkable as it was effective and by its very strangeness was the more potent, since in the science of the green warriors there was no defense for the singular mo manner of attack, the like of which it soon was evident to me they were as unfamiliar with as they were with the monstrosities which confronted them. The plant men charged to within a dozen feet of the party, and then with a bound rose as though to pass directly above their heads. His powerful tail was raised high to one side, and as he passed close above them he brought it down in one terrific sweep that crushed a green warrior's skull as though it had been an eggshell. The balance of the frightful herd was now circling rapidly and with bewildering speed about the little knot of victims. Their prodigious bounds and the shrill, shrieking purr of their uncanny mouths were well calculated to confuse and terrorize their prayer as that as two of them leaped simultaneously from each side, the mighty sweep of those awful tails met with no resistance, and two more green Martians went down to an ignoble death. There were now but one warrior and two females left, and it seemed that it could be but a matter of seconds ere these also lay dead upon the scarlet sword. 
But as two more of the plant men charged, the warrior, who was now prepared by the experiences of the past few mo minutes, swung his mighty long sword aloft and met the hurtling bulk with a clean cut that clove one of the plant men from chin to groan. The other, however, dealt a single blow with his cruel tail that laid both of the females crushed corpses upon the ground. As the green warrior saw the last of his companions go down, and at the same time perceived that the entire herd was charging him in a body, he rushed boldly to meet them, swinging his long sword in the terrific manner that I had so often seen the men of his kind wield it in their ferocious and almost continual warfare among their own race. Cutting and hewing to right and left, he laid an open path straight through the advancing plant men, and then commenced a mad race for the forest, in the shelter of which he evidently hoped that he might find a haven of refuge. He had turned for that portion of the forest which abutted on the cliffs, and thus the mad race was taking the entire party farther and farther from the boulder where I lay concealed. As I watched the noble fight which the great warrior had put up against such enormous odds, my heart had swelled in admiration for him, and acting as I am wont to do, more upon impulse than after mature de deliberation, I instantly sprang from my sheltering rock and bounded quickly toward the bodies of the dead green Martians, a well-defined plan of action already formed. Half a dozen great leaps brought me to the spot, and another instant saw me again in my stride in quick pursuit of the hideous monsters that were rapidly gaining on the fleeing warrior. But this time I grasped a mighty longsword in my hand, and in my heart was the old bloodlust of the fighting man, and a red mist swam before my eyes, and I felt my lips respond to my heart in the old smile that has ever marked me in the midst of the joy of battle. Swift as I was, I was none too soon, for the green warrior had been overtaken ere he had made half the distance to the forest, and now he stood with his back to a boulder, while the herd, temporarily balked, hissed and screeched about him. With their single eyes in the center of their heads, and every eye turned upon their prey, they did not note my soundless approach, so that I was upon them with my great long sword, and four of them lay dead ere they knew that I was among them. For an instant they recoiled before my terrific onslaught, and in the instant the green warrior rose to the occasion, and springing to my side laid to the right and left of him, as I had never seen but one other warrior do, with great circling strokes that formed a figure eight about him, and that never stopped until none stood living to oppose him, his keen blade passing through flesh and bone, and metal as though each had been alike thin air. As we bent to the slaughter, far above us rose the shrill, weird cry which I had heard once before, and which had called the herd to the attack upon their victims. Again and again it rose, but we were too much engaged with the fierce and powerful creatures about us to attempt to search out, even with our eyes, the author of the horrid notes. Great tails lashed in frenzied anger about us. Razor-like talons cut our limbs and bodies, and a green sticky syrup such as oozes from crushed caterpillar smeared us from head to foot, for every cut and thrust of our long swords brought spurts of this stuff upon us from the severed arteries of the plant men, through which it cursed courses in its sluggish vicinity in lieu of blood. Once I felt the great weight of one of the monsters upon my back, and as keen talons sank into my flesh, I experienced the frightful sensation of moist lips sucking the life blood from the wounds to which the claws still clung. I was very much engaged with a ferocious fellow who was endeavoring to reach my throat from in front, while two more, one on either side, were lashing viciously at me with their tails. The green warrior was much put to it to hold his own, and I felt that the unequal struggle could last but a moment longer when the huge fellow discovered my plight, and tearing himself from those that surrounded him, he raked the assailant from my back with a single sweep of his blade, and thus relieved I had little difficulty with the others. Once together we stood almost back to back against the great boulder, and thus the creatures were prevented from soaring above us to deliver their deadly blows, 
and as we were easily their match while they remained upon the ground, we were making great headway in dispatching what remained of them when our attention was again attracted by the shrill wail of the color above our heads. This time I glanced up, and far above us upon a little natural balcony on the face of the cliff stood a strange figure of a man shrieking out his shrill signal the while he waved one hand in the direction of the river's mouth as though beckoning to someone there, and with the other pointed and gesticulated toward us. A glance in the direction toward which he was looking was sufficient to apprise me of his aims and at the same time to fill me with the dread of dire apprehension, for streaming in from all directions across the meadow, from out of the forest, and from the far distance of the flat land across the river, I could see converging upon us a hundred different lines of wildly leaping creatures such as we were now engaged with, and with them some strange new monsters which ran with great swiftness now erect and now upon all fours. It will be a great death, I said to my companion. Look! As he shot a quick glance in the direction I indicated, he smiled. We may at least die fighting as great warriors should, John Carter, he replied. We had just finished the last of our immediate antagonists as he spoke, and I turned in surprised wonderment at the sound of my name, and there before my astonished eyes I beheld the greatest of the green men of Barsoom, their shrewdest statesman, their mightiest general, my great and good friend Tars Tarkas, Jeddak of Thark. End of chapter 1